Morning, everyone. Uh, right, so I'm going to probably spend the next 20 minutes just giving you an outline on partly who we are, our journey into cloud telephony, um, which has been challenging, but it's eye-opening, and I thought I'd share the journey with you. And if I can get it to work, I've tested this morning, it does, I'm going to give you a demonstration of actually how Zoom phone actually works. So you'll be able to see how flexible it is. So looking at me, uh, so I am the... Um, Global um, Voice Operations Manager for covering the whole of EMEA and APAC. That's around 50,000 employees uh, for everything that doesn't have America in the name. So I don't touch North America or South America, but I cover the rest of the world. Um, I've been here for 36 years now, uh, 30 of those in IT and 20 years in voice. So being a telecom manager, I've done pretty much everything. So I've done new offices, I've done new infrastructure, I've changed from traditional PBXs to IP telephony. Uh, and now, obviously, we're moving into cloud. So that's me. Who are Marshall McLennan? Well, we were formed in 1906. Um, in 1975, we acquired a company called Mercer. So eventually, the company's grown by acquisition, and we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, we acquired Sedgwick and Johnson Higgins in 1997. In 2001, we acquired an element of Alexander Forbes, which gave us a massive presence in South Africa and the Southern African um, belt. In 2003, we acquired Oliver Wyman, who are our analytics company, which I'll mention in a second. In 2018, we made our biggest acquisition, which was JLT, Jardine's Lloyd Thompson, which put us as the market leader in a number of sectors worldwide. So today, there we go, um, we are the world's leading professional services firm in areas of strategy and people. With over 100,000 employees worldwide in 130 countries, uh, with an annual revenue of $20 billion. So it's not a small company. Um, we have four market leading businesses Marsh, who are an insurance broker, who are the world's largest insurance broker. Guy Carpenter are a, a company that look after um, high end um, people looking after managing their assets and moving capital around. Mercer is the world's largest. Uh, employee benefits um, company that looks after basically pension schemes and employee benefits for companies worldwide. And Oliver Wyman, who are a management company, the, uh, the world's leading management company in its space. So we're not small, okay? Here's our footprint. So our footprint today is basically everything in here. And in terms of telephony, which is what we're mainly here for, everything in blue, before we started moving to cloud, to cloud was either Cisco clusters, so the whole of North America had two, Europe had one, Australia had, on the southern rim had one, one in South Africa and one in India. There were individual ones as well, so we had individual installations where we couldn't get bandwidth back to data centers. So basically the whole of the Middle East, Russia had its own, most of, most of China had its own, um, and certainly South, South America weren't even on Cisco, they were on the buyer. So we looked at the opportunity here and said, what can we do? How can we move our services into the cloud? And what I want to start with is asking you guys a question. Who in this room has thought about or is thinking about moving their services into the cloud? We well, you know you can use Mentimeter, so that's the code on Mentimeter to put this in. But I'm interested to know who in this room has already moved, is thinking of moving, wants to move, or hasn't even started or thought about it yet. Oh. Oh. Oh, it's it's changing. Well done. Well done. That's interesting. I like that. So, there we go. So, 50% of the room are already moving. It's interesting. Okay. 13 already thinking about it. 25 in the next two years. And 19 of you haven't started yet. So, we talked to the 19% in this room who haven't started. Plus those that are in the in the process of doing so. So who's afraid of it? What I mean by that is, what concerns do you have about moving to the cloud? Those that are moving today, what concerns you have had, and what concerns you are um, have challenged you along the way, or what's stopping you from doing it? So again, a couple of minutes, just one Single word. word. Single word, just chuck it in there with a bit of mind map on there. Okay. Nothing's standing out. Yet. Nothing's actually standing out. Yeah. I thought cost, cost and security were two big ones. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they are. They are. Yeah. They are. Yeah. <laughs> they are. 
So security's coming through as the bigger one, okay. Yeah. That's understandable. Okay, all right, we'll leave it at that. But thank you for that. So, what concerns did I have? The biggest one I had was a culture change. What I mean by culture change was how will our business accept the change that we want them to make? How will they get, how will they, you know how people don't like to change? We're now changing from what they're so used to the phone on the desk, easy access to something that's completely alien to them. So the culture was going to be the biggest concern. Similarly, user adoption. It's not a case of just getting through the barrier of changing the way they want to work, but actually getting them to do it. Getting them to understand how it works, changing their mindset, changing their mentality. The technology itself, how robust was it? How flexible was it? You know, how strong was it? Was it bleeding edge? Was it leading edge? How stable was it? You know, those sort of areas were giving me concerns. Telco support. So we are so used to our existing telephone providers giving a service this way. How will they move to providing it into a cloud? Will they be happy to adopt it? Will they be happy to move with us? Or do we need to change our telephone provider of service in the beginning? Vendor support. This is the vendor that we go to in the cloud. What's their support model like? How flexible is their platform? How nailed down is it? Are they going to be like... Microsoft would be throwing out software releases that no one knows about, under the, you know, things changing under the carpet, and the constant evolution of it. It's so new, it will continually evolve. It will continually change. How do we keep up with it? How do we keep people empowered? How do we met, give them the new tools at the rate at which <coughs> software is developed live? It's not like your traditional top software system. If you're on Cisco, for example, moving to the next version is you're in control of it. So you can test it, you can pilot it, you can come up with the documentation to send to your users. In a cloud environment, you don't have any of that luxury. So that was a concern. Cost wasn't, and I'll tell you for why, because think of your real estate. Think of what your current telephony estate is. How much is that costing you today? You're having to provide the hardware, you're having to provide the power, you're having to provide the environment, and then there's a licensee on top of it. Moving things to the cloud changes your whole costing model. So all that hardware basically goes away, and you're bringing to a licensed model. So those of you, I think, were using Prism, Prism's a licensed model. You have no hardware if you're running it as a, uh, as a UCAS service. So what encouraged us to change? Had to be there. It was the biggest change the industry and the world has ever seen in terms of its workforce. We've gone from being in an office with a physical phone on a desk to having to work remotely. Yes, a lot of people like to use these, but these don't necessarily work for office-based telephony. So COVID-19 was a good opportunity, not really, but yeah, it was an opportunity for us to rethink our whole telephony strategy in terms of how we make our, our workforce more mobile. There's also real estate rationalization. We're all seeing real estate costs going through the roof. So the cost of renting an office has gone is massive. And because of COVID, we're finding offices were being left empty. We were paying a significant amount of money to have a physical piece of real estate sitting there dormant, not being used. So because the real estate team were going, we can save money there and shaving it off, we were finding people were homeless, for want of a better description. Their offices had closed, or they were being asked to move hundreds of miles down the road. In the case of the US, thousands of miles away. So we need to make our workforce more mobile. There was also the spiraling costs, heat, power, um, data center costs, um, license costs themselves. The company was growing. So we were seeing our IT, our, our voice costs do this. So we had to find a plateau. Standardization. I showed you the map before of how many Cisco clusters we've got and installations of telephony we've got worldwide. This gave us the opportunity of moving to a single platform across the globe. That was quite a compelling argument when we look at how much real estate and how much equipment we've got dotted around the world. So, again, looking at the reduction in the voice hardware estate, you know, going from the clusters of our, the Cisco clusters we had all over the world to a single platform. Ease of use, believe it or not. 
it's very easy to use. And hopefully, if I get a chance in a minute, I'll show you how it works. Because how quick and how easy and how accessible it is without having any security risks. And it's flexibility. Because it's an evolving platform, it's extremely flexible. It's looking at what we've done, we've gone down a single pane of glass. Everything is in one place. We haven't got a voicemail platform sitting over here, a, vo uh, a telephony platform here, a call recording system here, um, a call report, um, a, a, an IVR system here. No, it's one platform. So we've actually got the opportunity of standardizing everything. Now our journey to Zoom. We've all heard of Zoom. Who's, who in here has been on a Zoom conference call or a Zoom meeting? And who in here know, knew that Zoom did telephony? Yeah. Again, it's a single pane of glass, but having seen other um, cloud solutions, Zoom wasn't actually my first choice. Because it was, at the time we first started looking at it, the leading edge. Yeah, they were late to the game, but the way they came into the market and the strategy that they adopted and the way that they were evolving and the people that they brought in, specifically for Cisco, meant that they had a good head start in the telephony space. Because if you look at Teams, the Microsoft Teams is not really a voice platform. It's not come from a voice heritage. It's been added in there. This, Zoom, was actually came from the people that were set it up came from a voice environment so that they knew what they were doing. Carrier compatibility. One of the greatest strengths that we found that Zoom had, it gave us the opportunity to peer in the cloud. So we had already moved a significant amount of our real estate onto SIP. So EMEA was running on SIP using Orange Business Services OBS. BT would move to BT SIP in the UK, AT&T in the US. We were starting to think about how we moved other parts of the world across to SIP. This gave us the perfect opportunity to do it. So we were either how we could take, you know, we could use those, we could keep our existing carriers for the majority of our real estate and move others into Zoom themselves because Zoom themselves are a carrier. <coughs> Hence porting. Who's ever tried porting between uh, carriers in this room? We all know the pain involved with it. The significant reductions in porting by keeping the existing carriers where we could was a huge selling point. And the ease of ability to port numbers where we couldn't into Zoom was actually quite compelling. They were pretty experienced at it, and the experience that we've had with them has been um, quite significant and quite impressive. And what we've done is we've started with the easiest first, as you would always do. The US was an easy hit because it was very uncomplicated. The UK would only just start hit because it's a very complicated to say. But we have basically started the ball rolling by hitting the easiest ones that we can get to. Now looking at Zoom phone itself, this is what it looks like. If you've ever been on the Zoom meeting or ever downloaded the Zoom app, that's what you'd see. So if you're joining any Zoom, conf uh, any Zoom meeting, that's the Zoom desktop. The phone, the phone on the top. Click into it, there's your phone. And that's accessible on a mobile, on a desktop, through the app, anywhere. And what I'm going to try and do now is show you a live demo time. Boom, I'm in. I'm not even connected to our corporate network. I'm literally on the internet. Now, I'd actually cached this beforehand, so if I hadn't done this originally to test this, it's got two-factor authentication on it. So in order for me to actually access it anywhere, if I got my laptop out now and showed you, I'd have to go through two-factor authentication. So I'm actually, I need to authenticate it on this before I can even get in. But once I'm in, boom, I'm in. And I've got full access to the entire system. And there's all my users. Luckily, that's the Manchester ones. But that's only because they've just been added. But I've got users. I can get to any user anywhere in the world. As you 
can see. One single pane of glass for everything. And then, sorry, this is actually quite difficult to see. I'm looking at this one. So if I've got all my sides, that is pretty much every site worldwide. And you can see we've currently got 642 sites on it. But basically that is all in, it's all in one place, single pane of glass. And again, I need nothing else other than just an internet connection and um, authentication to the organization. So it's extremely secure. Okay. So where are we now? You remember that? I showed you that earlier on. That was our footprint at the beginning of 2021. This is where we are now. So the whole of North America's moved. Just an exception of that. Um, the whole of, most of South America's moved. The whole of Australia's moved. The whole of South America's, uh, South Africa's moved. Most of Europe have moved. So, so far, we have put 65,000 uh, of our employees across to the system. What's stopping is, is carrier compatibility in, the, in, in Asia. So, because porting is not allowed in India, porting is not allowed in China, we're having to rethink how we do that in those countries. And in India, we're looking at carrier peering with the two main vendors in India. Or, or shall I say Zoom are looking to carry up here. And that basically means we're putting gateways on site to give us connectivity into the cloud. So it's not as easy in every location, but across most of the world, we can do this. Canada, we had challenges with Bell Telecom. We've overcome those. They're moving in about four weeks, and that's 14,000 people. And they'll be moved across within the space of a week. So it's really quick to adopt it. And what's for the future? The thing we're finding with Zoom is Zoom is growing very quickly. So they originally wanted to merge with, they put a, 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 um, an aggressive takeover bid in for five nines, it was rejected. So they thought, sorry, we'll do it ourselves. We've got the skills, we've got the people, they've built their own contact center environment. And it's really good. The problem we got with five nines is five nines is quite expensive, it's all license based, but it all bolts into the same pane of glass. We're not applying different systems, it's all in one place. Tiger come into this now because as of yesterday, <laughs> I'll better explain this in a bit, as of yesterday, we now have a Tiger instance for Zoom with live feeds being taken from our data to now enable us to analyze and start to use Prism, which is a big selling point for Tiger. For our point of view, uh, it also gives you worldwide coverage. So I'm able to actually use this anywhere in the world, whereas with Prism, Prism is only really tied to one environment, which is EMEA. So my footprint here, and I've got most of my global colleagues turn around and say, can we do this, can we do this, can we do this? Yeah, we can. Because of the reports that we currently got, and what, it was one of the major selling points that enabled me to get us to sign the contract with Tiger to get them to put Prism in or to build the, the, uh, the module for Zoom. Asset tracking. Asset tracking has always been a challenge, certainly for things like license control, uh, <laughs> equipment management. Because of the analytics capability of Tiger, we have that capability now, or we will have that capability. It's there. The, fee the functionality is there. The opportunity is there, which we've never really had before. So as I said, license management. We've got over 100,000 licenses on Zoom at the moment, and I can guarantee you, from the report that we ran two days ago, 35% of those are dormant, with people who never use it. So they give the opportunity of actually pulling back licenses that we know aren't being used. You know, we had a carte blanche, everyone has it, we have no way of tracking it, now we can. And more reports. It goes back to what we were talking about, what Louise was talking about in terms of giving you that flexibility now to start to analyze what you've got, to grow what you've got. The opportunities are there, and now we have that flexibility, or we will have that flexibility. We know that certainly Tiger can give us that, and that's one of the key reasons why I'm still here, and I'm still coming to this, because I know the features are there and can be delivered. That's pretty much it. 
I hope that was informative. Anyone got any questions or anyone want to challenge me? There's one at the back. Go for it. I've got a question. Right. So in a world where everybody is suddenly <laughs> streaming, and streaming is 4K and 8K, etc., do you have any concerns that uh, the IRS community is throttling bandwidth that might affect how your bandwidth content can work? Good question. Um, it's... Uh, I have no concerns over it. We're, we're currently running SD1 now. We put every single one of our UK offices is now running SD1, which is our data network over the internet. So we're running big pipes into every single office. Um, data contention with voice has never been an issue, even for our bigger offices. Whereas with Cisco Jabber, if anyone, anyone in here on Cisco know full well what Jabber and IP communicator can be like, yeah, they are bound with hungry and they fall apart all the time and they need upgrading all the time. Never have a problem with uh, with Zoom at all. So your bandwidth is never going to be an issue. Or it hasn't been so far for me. Rob? I'm just interested, obviously, in the move to Zoom. Yeah. I don't need figures, but have you made some significant cost savings? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wait, the... One of the drivers we've got with the project, and we're trying our best to get it in as fast as we can, is we've got to sign a new contract with Cisco for licenses. Um, and we probably shaved around about 15% of our voice costs purely on licenses alone by moving to Zoom. As far as the call charge is concerned, actually Zoom themselves are saving us significant money by using them as the carrier in South America. So we've moved from Telefonica to Zoom Native, to Zoom are our carrier, and we're getting North American rates in South America, which is unheard of. So we're saving a significant amount of money outside of Europe, but across the world, on call charges. So whilst it's not visible to start with, it certainly will become a lot more visible when we start analyzing it, once we get everybody across. You want to move on? And no, 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 if there's any more questions, any more please questions? feel free. Go on, Steve. Two, Steve. Ah. One is, what directory system are you using for your worldwide thing with them with Zoom? How are you getting to it? And the other one is, are you using Tiger for the costing now through the Zoom carriers? We, but today we're not. Because um, Zoom are being, we're using um, Tango in the US for our cost analysis. However, mm. the plan will be to use the reports that we've got within Tiger to actually get us a better holistic view because what we're getting from Tango is not feature rich and does not have the level of, uh, of reporting that we want and the, the breakdown that I want. To your first question, which was? The directory. The directory, of course. Um, the way we've structured it, I, I mean, I showed you very briefly the, 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 the site codings that we've got. The directory is very, very holistic because every user is associated to a site. And that site is accessible worldwide. So we can break our directory down by country, by office, um, by state in the US. So I'll give you a great example, because the US is now fully on Zoom. Hurricane Ian has just hit the US. By having the ability to search by state, they were able to find every single employee that was in Florida and move them and move the services across. So any core queues, they could move across. Any receptions, they could move across purely by looking for the state. And that's built into the way we've designed the structure and the directory. So from a DR point of view, the US have found it incredibly easy, um, flexible and very, very useful. No, we've not done counties in, um, in the UK. We've not done regions in Germany or in France. But we still have that ability to pull particular areas apart and go, right, we want to move all those, boom, it's done. So it's very, very flexible. And that's a, no, that's a real world example. Okay. Perfect. Lovely. Steve, thank you so much. showing off not only does he give us a very informative demo but he does that live demo bit as well it's always a brave choice 